This scale determines whether millions of people evacuate or stay. Categories 1 through 5. But here's what it doesn't tell you. This number only measures wind speed, nothing else. 108 people died in Hurricane Helene, not from wind, but from water. I'm 600 miles away from where Hurricane Helene made landfall, and this is where it did the most damage. Did you really think it was going to happen? No, no. I mean, literally, I had no, it, it, it was shocking. The storm didn't weaken, the danger just changed. But the system we use to warn people hasn't. We've had tail ends of hurricanes, so we thought just, you know, we might have some water. Western North Carolina, hurricanes don't hit here. <laughs> Not supposed to anyways. <laughs> this is the Saffir Simpson hurricane scale. What you see in the forecasts, the headlines, emergency alerts, but it tells you nothing truly accurate about storm surge. Nothing about rainfall. Nothing about speed, size, or reach. For instance, Recently, it didn't warn the hill country in Texas, flooded by the moisture brought in by a tropical storm that made landfall days earlier in Mexico. We get flash flood warnings on our phones all the time. I think it's like the Ambler Alert, or you, you live in Texas, you don't really think much of it. And um, obviously we were wrong. I mean, I didn't even know it was supposed to be raining, let alone a, a flood coming. The dangers that don't show up in the category, those are the ones that kill. We're not prepared for water incidents uh, to this magnitude. And we've built our public warning system on a number that has almost nothing to do with the danger people actually face. The Saffir Simpson hurricane scale is used by millions to judge a storm's threat. But in this documentary, I'm going to show how this system is broken and how millions are needlessly and dangerously risking their lives because of it. What I'm about to show you will completely flip your understanding of hurricane danger. Two storms. One was the strongest hurricane ever recorded in the Western Hemisphere. The other barely qualified as a tropical storm. Guess which one did more damage? Rapid intensification is exactly what it sounds like. It's when a storm explodes in strength quickly. Patricia did more than intensify. It made history. In just 24 hours, it went from a tropical storm to the strongest hurricane ever recorded in the Western Hemisphere, 215 mile per hour winds. It made landfall on Mexico's Pacific coast with devastating strength. But only a few lives were lost and there was minimal damage. Why? Because Patricia hit a sparsely populated region with fewer than 30 people per square mile. But then there was Imelda, a tropical storm with barely enough wind to bend a palm tree. No roar, no headlines, but it parked over Texas and unleashed 43 inches of rain. Neighborhoods turned into lakes, freeways disappeared. It dumped more water than almost any storm in U.S. history. And that's the gut punch. A fraction of Patricia's wind speed, but it was 900% more costly. The strongest hurricane ever recorded, $500 million in damages, barely a tropical storm system, $5 billion. The scale is completely backwards. It's like I knocked out Mike Tyson. Imelda didn't have the power, but water doesn't need fists. And that's the problem. We still measure hurricanes like it's all about the punch. Hurricane Harvey wasn't most dangerous at landfall. It was most dangerous after it wasn't even a hurricane. August 2017, a tropical whisper in the Gulf explodes into a Category 4 monster in less than two days. We just had no idea, you know, there's going to strengthen like that. We kept thinking maybe just tropical storms, so everybody that I know is evacuating, yes, sir. It slams into Rockport, Texas with 130 mile per hour winds, the first major U.S. hurricane in 12 years. But after landfall, Harvey unraveled. Its winds faded. It slowed, then stalled. By August 26th, it was just a tropical storm. And that's when the real disaster began. Because Harvey didn't truly weaken, it transformed into something the scale can't measure. Harvey hovered over southeast Texas, barely moving. 
Its rain bands pulled Gulf moisture inland like a conveyor belt. Over 50 inches of rain in parts of Houston. More than 30,000 people displaced. 200,000 homes and businesses damaged. 17,000 rescues. A slow motion disaster that no one could stop. The wind made headlines. The rain rewrote the rules. The Saffir Simpson hurricane scale created in the 1970s only measures wind. Once that wind is gone, the threat is, quote, over. Except it isn't. One year later, we learn that again as another storm crawled to shore at walking speed. September 2018. Hurricane Florence churns across the Atlantic, a classic Cape Verde storm. By September 11th, it's a Category 4 beast. But wind shear tears at the structure, and by landfall, it's just a Category 1. And that word, just, became dangerous. Florence wasn't dying. It was slowing, widening, soaking up moisture like a sponge. When it reached the Carolinas, it crawled ashore at two miles per hour, walking speed, and it didn't leave. Over 30 inches of rain fell in North Carolina, two feet in parts of South Carolina. Rivers rose for days, then weeks. Towns were cut off, roads disappeared, $24 billion in damages, 53 lives lost. Not from wind, from water. Two storms, two different paths, same trap. A lower category made people feel safer, just as the real danger was beginning. The Saffir Simpson scale told them the storm was weakening, but the flood didn't care, and neither did the damage. And even if we measured wind perfectly, that still wouldn't tell the full story. Because next, I'll show you how size, something the scale completely ignores, can turn a weak hurricane into a killer. If you've ever lived through a hurricane, you know once the wind dies down, the power stays out. That's why I'm working with Jackery this hurricane season and highlighting the Home Power 3000. With a 3072 watt battery and 3600 watts of output, this thing isn't just for charging phones and flashlights, it can run real appliances and keep your food fresh. You get five AC outlets, four standard 20 amp and one 30 amp heavy duty plug with a total output of 3600 watts and up to 7200 watts of surge power for things like fridge compressors or AC units kicking on. Add in a dual 100 watt USB-C ports, a USB-A quick charge, and a 12 volt car port, and you can power everything. For most people, this unit packs up to two days of full kitchen power. For instance, you can keep your fridge running and food cool. But for me, I actually don't keep a lot of perishables around with a hurricane coming, but I do need a good night's sleep, and that means running a portable AC unit. It's quiet, there are no fumes, and when the sun comes up, I recharge it with solar panels. I'm using the Jackery Solar Generator 500X kit. It comes with six 85 watt Solar Saga panels that are designed to specifically work with the Home Power 3000. And I don't have to rely on finding gas when everyone else is desperate. Whether you need to save food or just your sanity, the Home Power 3000 is something I consider an essential home backup. So don't wait until there's a storm already on the way. I have a link in the description so you can check it out, get prepared, and sleep better knowing you're ready. In September 2008, Hurricane Ike was a beast. A Category 4 buzzsaw, tearing through the Turks and Caicos, hammering Cuba twice, leaving a trail of destruction that matched its terrifying wind speed. For days, the world watched a storm behaving exactly as the scale predicted. Then it entered the Gulf and weakened. Category two, manageable, right? Wrong. Here's the problem. The Saffir Simpson scale has no number for size. As Ike's winds dropped, its footprint exploded. Its giant wind field shoved water across the shallow Gulf shelf, building a storm surge that had nothing to do with its category. The result, 15 to 20 feet of storm surge. The flooding started hours before the eyewall arrived. Coastal communities underwater before the worst winds ever hit. On the Boulevard Peninsula, entire neighborhoods vanished, stripped down to the slabs of concrete. 
That's where a new term entered the hurricane's lexicon, quote, to be slapped. I killed more than 100 people in the U.S. Many stayed behind because the storm had weakened, because a lower category made it sound safer. If the scale measured storm surge instead of wind, how many more would have left? Keep that question in mind, because I'm about to show you the most recent example of this deadly pattern. Helene wasn't ignored. It was feared. It slammed into the Gulf Coast as a Category 4 hurricane, one of the strongest storms to hit the U.S. in recent years. But what people didn't expect was that the worst destruction wouldn't come at landfall. It came after, hundreds of miles inland. This wasn't a surprise per se. The models forecasted the inland flooding potential, but people weren't evacuating, governments weren't forcing it. The winds were dying down, the storm was weakening. The scale said that Helene was basically finished. People do not think that, no, I need to actually evacuate. And what happens is then it just gets too late and you can't leave. Because by that time, the water may have already washed out part of the road and you're just stuck. And then where do you go? Sometimes we let our guard down after a storm weakens and that's just as dangerous. A tropical storm does this much damage again in the mountains. I mean, it's just, it's unbelievable. Do you think that when it's called like tropical storm and not a category five, that some people maybe don't take it as seriously? Don't evacuate? True, I believe so. No one alive has seen destruction like this in Appalachia. Highways, homes, businesses washed away. Much hasn't returned. And just took, it took a lot away. It took business. There's, uh, I believe, six of us in business down in that cave. Not one of us is open. Helene wasn't the deadliest hurricane since Katrina because it was a Category 4. It was because Helene had everything that the current category system ignores. So what if we stopped thinking in categories altogether? What if we built a new system? not for meteorologists, but for people in the path. Let's call it what it really is, an impact index. Instead of a single number based on wind, like the old Saffir-Simpson scale that really only measures wind speeds and gives a general idea of storm surge, you get a storm profile, a breakdown of all the threats. Storm surge, flooding, size, speed, and wind. First, storm surge. It's the greatest killer. Instead of hiding behind jargon, it's front and center. A simple scale from one to five based on predicted height above ground level. A surge level five doesn't mean strong wind, it means a wall of water, unsurvivable, even if the sky is calm. We've seen what a surge level five would look like. Hurricane Katrina, category four, go for it. Not because of Katrina's Category 3 winds, but because of a 28-foot storm surge, the massive storm pushed ashore. Big wave, big wave, big wave. Watch the storm. Levees failed, flood walls gave out, and New Orleans began to drown. The data is already there. The National Hurricane Center already forecasts these threats, and they do so with incredible accuracy, like storm surge. Hurricane Helene Center was about 100 miles off the coast of Florida, but the NHC forecasted a life-threatening storm surge for St. Petersburg. Some neighborhoods received up to seven feet of storm surge, and that's why you have multi-million dollar mansions that are now sitting abandoned. Some even had to be completely demolished after the storm. Next flooding, the second biggest killer. This index would rate flood threats based on projected rainfall totals. A flood level five means expect catastrophic inland flooding, like Harvey, like Helene. Ask yourself, if this system existed when Tropical Storm Barry came ashore in Mexico, a weak storm, long gone, but its remnants help fuel flash flooding that killed over 100 in Texas. Would people have taken it more seriously? Would lives have been saved? 
The index would also account for a storm's behavior, its size, the Ike factor, warning that a massive storm can generate surge far beyond its category, and its speed, the Florence and Harvey factor, alerting an entire region to the danger of a slow-moving stall that can produce devastating rain for days. And finally, wind, the one part of the Saffir-Simpson scale that still matters, but now put in context, not the headline, just a piece of the story. Let's go back to my first examples, Hurricane Patricia versus Tropical Storm Imelda. Patricia had the strongest winds ever recorded in the Western Hemisphere, but it was tiny, fast moving, and hit a sparsely populated stretch of coastline. It didn't stall, it didn't really flood cities. The real impact was closer to mild. Imelda, on the other hand, wasn't even rated on the old Saffir Simpson scale, but with the new impact scale, you can see it was a Category 5 flood threat. The stalled speed also helped make this storm a killer. The new impact scale clearly explains the dangers and what didn't matter with Imelda, the wind. This index doesn't ask what kind of storm is coming. It tells you what it's going to do. From names and categories to impacts. Because we can't prevent catastrophes, but we can prevent tragedies. Although there is one problem no forecast can fix. Imagination. When something's never happened before, it doesn't feel real until it's already happening. If uh, you were watching the news and a meteorologist is like, hey, we expect like Hurricane Harvey rain 600 miles inland in Bat Cave, North Carolina. Would that have changed your perspective before the hurricane or would you still not have believed it? I wouldn't have believed it. It's hard to imagine the hurricane actually the center of it the eye, I guess, over top of us. We can build better scales, stronger forecasts, clearer alerts. We can show people the numbers, the surge, the rain, the risk. But a perfect warning only works if someone's willing to listen. And too often, we don't until it's too late.